Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to extend my very warm welcome to you for today's event, View Matters. We are very happy to greet so many participants in this beautiful building. And um, why do we have so many participants? Well, one could say that the university is a place for scholarly debates and um, research uh, of scholars, debate among scholars, and that certainly is true, but that's not all. There's also something which is getting increasingly important, and that is the university's third mission. That is um, communication, communicating knowledge uh, to the outside, to the general public, to the interested public, to you. And that is why I'm so very happy to have you with us today and to be able to be with you uh, with this very interesting topic, with this crucial topic for our future. And a topic, artificial intelligence, where we do have uh, great experts today on the podium, great experts sharing their views, their knowledge with us. Um, and obviously, only a couple of years ago, artificial intelligence was discussed as um, a theoretical construct, as something which had probably some very special applications in some small areas, or something you would see in a science fiction movie. Um, today, artificial intelligence is ubiquitous. And that is, uh, namely, both our personal and professional lives. All of us use it, so that's why AI for all that's where the main title of this event comes from. Because thanks to technical advancements, AI, AI today not only is able to analyze large amounts of data, not only to produce texts, images, and videos with human-like precision, but also to produce them within milliseconds and from scratch. And all of us know ChatGPT. And it's systems with a very interactive and easy to use in user interface. And they have made AI an everyday technology, accessible to everyone. And of course, this was a huge effort uh, from industry and science which made this possible. But that is not all, because um, any technology, not just AI, but any technology, can only be socially valuable uh, if it is implemented responsibly and on an informed basis. And that is probably what will be the main focus of today's discussion, if I understand you correctly. Namely, uh, how can we as business and economic scholars, or as part of the general public, contribute, contribute to this dialogue which ensures and responsible application. So today's discussion will focus on the theme, balancing progress with responsibility. And um, we will talk about or hear about important questions. How far are we in the adoption process of AI? In the hype cycle, where are we? What is going to happen next, probably? Who will be affected most by the revolution of artificial intelligence? because I think there is little doubt that this is a revolution. And of course, the core question, how can we ensure that benefits accrue in the first place and can be distributed equally among all sectors of society in the second place? And these questions obviously are not just academic, but urgent pressing issues which demand our intention and thoughtful informed responses. Hence, uh, we are very happy to discuss this here. However, I do not want to forestall the discussion, which is not to imply that I could do that in any case, but I just want to, uh, before we start, uh, I just want to give a big thank you to everyone who made this event possible, namely the experts on the podium today, the Institute of um, Digital Marketing and Behavioral Insights, and especially Professor Schamp and Melanie Clegg, and of course the event management team and all the other persons who have contributed in the background. So 
Without any further delay, I now hand over to Melanie Clegg, who will guide you through the evening. And I'm really looking forward to this great event. Thank you. So, good evening also from my side, and many thanks, um, Professor Winner, for this very kind introduction, and also um, for foreshadowing some of the information of what we will be talking about today, which is AI for all. So tonight will all be about artificial intelligence, and I have the great pleasure to um, introduce some great experts um, in today's discussion panel. But first of all, we want to kick off this event with uh, some scientific insights, which will be provided by the head of our institute, um, the Institute for Digital Marketing and Behavioral Insights, Professor Christina Schamp. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Um, very welcome also from my side. Um, it's really great to see so many familiar and also new faces. And thank you for the interest in today's discussion. Thanks also for the introduction and mentioning our title and liking our title. And maybe going away from the script right from the beginning, tell you one secret. This title was generated via ChatGPT. <laughs> so, AI, as we heard, is currently everywhere. So, I don't know if it's just my echo chamber, but my LinkedIn is full of AI posts. But also, I sense that the mainstream media and <laughs> the current public discourse is heavily reporting on AI. However, this narrative about AI and its consequences is a little bit black and white from my perspective. On the one hand, the public discourse portrays AI as fascinating utopia, saving the world and benefiting humanity, reaching extraordinary achievements in many disciplines. And at the same time, AI is portrayed as threatening dystopia, leading to the end of the world, changing all the jobs, we will all lose our jobs, and it will distort what we know, th know is truth. Both extremes portray AI as an abstract, godlike mysterium. Right? Something that happens to us rather than a concrete digital technology that everybody is now able to use. So the aim of today's discussion is to demystify AI and focus on the usage of AI. Not saying that we're not touching base on the pro and cons, right? Balancing progress with responsibility. But still looking at it from a very practical perspective. So why do we believe is now the right time to talk about AI usage or AI literacy? I will give you briefly three reasons for that. One of our guests is already laughing because, you know, in consulting, it's always three reasons. But <laughs> I learned that in my previous life. Okay, but it is actually three reasons, right? Um, <laughs> sorry. So first of all, AI itself is not a new phenomenon. Actually, the term AI has been coined back in 1955. And it comprises everything referring to machines performing cognitive tasks like the human mind. So that means these machines can learn, 
interact and problem solve without we are telling them how to do that. Since the 1950s, AI technology has come a far way. And since the 2000, like from the year 2000, has seen exponential progress, especially due to deep learning. Deep learning are neural networks that are advancing how nat natural lang language processing works. They rely on deep neural networks mimicking the human brain and have made exponential progress. So just 10 years ago, a machine could not reliably provide performance compared to human performance regarding different kind of language or speech or image recognition. This has changed. Nowadays, they are even able to beat human in tests in these domains. This has paved the way for now generative AI models. So whereas classic supervised machine learning was focusing on classifying images correctly. So think about classifying an email as spam or not as spam, or quite tricky, identifying if this image portrays a blueberry muffin or a chihuahua. We are now in the world of generative models where they, where they create new and original content based on transformer-based architectures. So here I used the prompt, a muffin that looks like a chihuahua, and this model generated images from that text. This transformer architecture is the foundation for many state-of-the-art models that are used, including generative pre-trade transformers, short GPT. Second, and these cutting-edge models are now available for everyone. Just one and a half years ago, OpenAI released ChatGPT, and other competitors like Copilot and others followed, and made this powerful tools available for everyone at large scale. And since then, adoption in general was exponential. Just within two months, ChatGPT has reached 100 million users and was way faster than Netflix, Google Translate, and even some of the very popular social media platforms. This then allows the consumers not only to passively consume products, that are using AI in their services and products for quite a long time, but rather also to generate content and actively interact with these conversational agents. Because AI is used in many ways. We use it every day for translating, for smart home products like Alexa or Siri, for interactions with service chatbots during closed office hours, and also, of course, in recommendation engines that are very sophisticated in predicting which song or which movie we might like best based on our own preferences, but also on preferences of similar other consumers. And lately, 
It's also used by providing conversation starters or icebreakers in dating apps. Now, consumers can actively generate content. And these tools are so powerful that they are already used to co-create award-winning photographs, like the one you see here, or to write, co-write whole novels. You can use them to generate titles for <laughs> roundtables, <laughs> but also social media posts or logos for a given startup. They help in scientific writing <laughs> whenever you disclose to do so. And there's, they're even used nowadays in consumer competitions to co-create new designs like Nike sneakers or design new flavors. Here, for instance, um, a new flavor designed from Coca-Cola with the help of AI. Third, it is important to talk about AI adoption now because coming from all these advancements, AI allows us to automate a lot of administrative tasks and tasks that are very data heavy, collecting and processing it. That means, on the one hand, a lot of productivity increase. It frees time that I focus on relevant tasks, my expertise, managing people, communicating more. But on the other hand, there might also be the risk of some jobs being fully automated. There are different, very sophisticated predictions and analysis how many of these jobs will be replaced. I picked one where Austria <laughs> was included. And here, the estimates are that by 2030, around 25% of the workplace and the jobs will not exist anymore as they do now. So in general, that means we have a common understanding in the scientific world that in the future, there will be shifts in future skills. Which skills will be more important? Social and emotional skills, advanced cognitive skills like creativity, critical thinking. But also we need AI literacy to ensure collaboration with these tools. And for the jobs at risk, this also is a challenge which needs a lot of upskilling of a substantial proportion of the workforce. Now, until now, I've used AI usage, AI literacy interchangeably. So, building an AI-empowered society that benefits all requires each of us to become literate about AI. This was a quote from the World Economic Forum this year. But what does AI literacy mean? To base the discussion on a little bit common grounds regarding what AI literacy and literacy in general means, it comprises three steps. Very basic, we should know and understand what AI is. So I'm aware of certain tools, I know relevant AI, AI applications, but I also have, and this is important, an understanding of the intuition how AI models work. I cannot go into too much detail today in that respect, but it's important to understand that they're probabilistic. And in general, you can think of any model based on the data that, that they have been trained on. The next step is use and evaluate. You're able to use and apply applications for a specific task, but you're also able to critically evaluate the results and the output of the applications given that they are probabilistic and there might be biases, which we by now, I guess, all have heard about. 
The last point, and this is especially um, important from a company perspective, is create and customize. The true potentials of these models lies in the, in the fact that you can use the pre-trained model and customize and adopt it to your use case to create your own application. Importantly, and at best, you should and cannot skip each of these steps. So when you aim to create a new NI tool, and best you are able to evaluate the outcome and you understand what the models are doing. Okay, so now the crucial question is, what is the status quo of AI usage and AI literacy in Austria? When we prepared for it, we realized, actually, we don't know. Currently, there's a lot of discussion and surveys and reports what managers think, but not so much for Austria what the general public thinks. So I teamed up with my dear colleague, Dieter Scharitzer and his uh, company, TQS, and for this evening, <laughs> we ran a representative survey to have a holistic and comprehensive sample and assessment of this status quo. Don't worry, we will summarize all the details in a report and publish it on our website soon. For now, let me end that introduction with a glimpse regarding these three stages of AI literacy. So first of all, when we think about what is the general public thinking about AI, we started off, you know, I'm a psychologist, what are your associations with AI? Turns out, two things. AI is ChatGPT, so kudos for their marketing efforts. And secondly, still, negative sentiment and fear prevails. So there are a lot of associations surrounding danger. Bearing that in mind, we asked about knowing and understanding AI. And we asked that in two different aspects. First, we asked, what do you know about AI? Do you feel well informed? Do you, ha do you have ha high expertise? So that was a subjective assessment, own assessment. And in addition, we asked them, which of these applications use AI? And we gave them 13 different ones, similar to the ones that we've shown before, right? Where AI is used. And then we counted how many of the correct, were correct answers. By the way, all of these applications were built with AI. What we see here is that on average, there's only satisfactory level of AI literacy in Austria nowadays. So in a school grade from one to five, the average person gives him or herself a three. Interestingly, we find differences, significant ones, between males and females. So females rate themselves as less experienced. Although, <laughs> when we look at actual performance, this different this difference is not significant. Sorry for this little excurse, but this is something that we see quite often regarding technology. Females are a little bit more insecure and hesitant, although 65%, 63 66 there are no differences between genders in actual AI knowledge. So, we also asked, do you use, or how often do you use AI at work? So note that this is a conservative measure because we only asked and reduced the sample for Austrians that le at least partly work with a PC, like uh, with a computer. And here we see already quite a divide. 
34% have not ever used AI at their workforce, at their workplace until now. Whereas we have 25% early adopters. So who are they? Who are the early adopters and who are the laggards? They differ across several dimensions. Not surprisingly, early adopters are younger, have a higher education, are more from urban areas, and describe themselves in general as being one that tries, tries, likes to try out new technology. They also have, in fact, higher AI, AI knowledge, and 55% say they have some sort of um, leadership position. Sector-wise, interestingly, and we will look more into that, obviously they're coming more from IT backgrounds. They're less so from public services. The opposite is true when we look at laggards. Less informatics in IT, more public service, and also, interestingly, more people working in logistics and transportation. So already when we look at that and looking back at what might be jobs that face a risk of automation, this might be an alarming picture. There are even more indications of some sort of a digital divide, just to bring you some numbers. From the early adopters, over half report, they think they have a competitive advantage over their colleagues by using AI. Even more so because 30% say they're not really completely always transparent that they have used AI for their work. 70% believe that AI will be important for their future job. Alarmingly, only 25% of the laggards believe that AI will be important for their future job. They also find it completely unfair to use AI. It's like cheating. And they also don't plan to use it in the future. Looking at creating and customizing and adding a notion also to understanding more what we could do with this digital divide, we asked to what extent they are aware of that their company has an AI strategy. We will hear more about that. But only 27% of companies nowadays in Austria say they have some sort of an AI strategy. Either by having a policy for standardized AI applications, and even less so, 12% by having created a customized AI solution for their business. On the other hand, there's a huge portion that everybody just uses as it fits, or even I don't know. Interestingly, when we look at where are the early adopters working and where are the laggards working, 90% of laggards come from companies that are working without any kind of policy. And the other way around, 50% of early adopters are working in companies that have some sort of AI strategy. So this is not cause and effect, and it might influence each other, but clearly there might be also some sort of a sector divide. And some companies are more prepared than others. To, to finish that up, we also asked, looking ahead, are you interested to learn more about AI? Are you willing to attend trainings about critical usage? And then they could rate it from one to five. And when I look at that, in that dimension, how willing are they to learn? And then match that to how much do they already know we can see that there's no, not a no-size-fits-all no solution. There are some people that already know a lot and want to know more. 
right? These are the promoters and the critical thinkers. But there are also, especially among the laggards, people that don't know much and they really don't also don't want to invest more in learning more, right? These are really a big proportion, 30% of the population is in that sector. We have late bloomers that realize they have to do more. Maybe they don't know how to start. And of course, we have skeptics. They know a lot. They also think they know enough, <laughs> right? But leaving it here, the questions now are, how can we foster now AI literacy so that no one is left behind? So how can we balance progress and responsibility? And I give the floor now back to Melody. I'm very happy that we have the experts to answer these questions and looking also forward to questions from the audience later. So yeah, thank you very much, Christina. Um, to me, it was a very interesting study um, and very interesting data. And um, I think it gives us much, uh, much um, material to discuss now with our um, experts that we are very happy um, to welcome today. Um, unfortunately, we had one dropout today, so there are only four chairs. Um, Katja Meyer um, couldn't attend tonight because um, she had a sudden illness. So um, we are left with two experts, uh, which is great because then we can spend more time with you <laughs> answering our questions. Um, so let me introduce um, our first guest, which is Alexandra Ebert. She is the Chief Trust Officer at Mostly AI. And Mostly AI is actually a company with um, AI in its DNA. Um, so it has a pioneering role in the, um, in the field of synthetic data, which is particularly important in privacy-sensitive um, branches like banking or health industry. Um, and Alexandra herself, is an expert for um, responsible AI, thin synthetic data, and privacy. And she's also um, selected as one um, 30 under 30 member. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to have you tonight. Um, so one round of applause for Alexandra. Thank you. So our second guest um, tonight is Thibaut Meray, who is a managing director and partner at Boston Consulting Group. So most of you may know the Boston Consulting Group um, and its um, pioneering role also in the digital um, transformation. So some of you may know that BCG has just recently, so in the last year, actually conducted a study um, about the co-work of consultants with generative AI. And we're happy that uh, Tibor might share some of the details about it um, in the discussion that follows now. So um, welcome to Tibor, um, an expert for digital transformation in organizations. Okay. And of course, last but not least, we still need the scientific side um, at our <laughs> university. So this uh, role is, of course, filled by Christina. So um, please take your seat as well. <laughs> and also a round of applause for her, maybe. <laughs> oh, thank OK, so uh, thanks all for being here. and. Um, as a beginning of the discussion, um, I would like to first ask our guests whether the presented findings um, that we actually revealed in our survey do resonate with your personal and professional experience. So maybe the first question to you, Alexandra. From your experience, um, what are the root causes for these differences that we saw in the reluctance of AI adoption? So, would you say it's rather an anxiety or fear, or is it rather a lacking awareness um, of the potential of artificial intelligence? 
I didn't contact a scientifically representative survey here, so I can only speak from my experience. I think it's both. So many organizations and also many employees within organizations are confronted with this hype of the AI doomers, the AI boomers, where it's really confusing to keep up. And many actually are then in a fear position where they're in the freeze mode and are not really open to try out these technologies. So this is a big problem for many organizations where they first need to get the uh, fears associated with AI out of the minds of the people so that they can start experimenting. But also when it comes to how to actually use it, I think there are big differences. So it's not surprising for me that people working in the IT sector are more prone to trying these uh, tools out versus, for example, I was uh, speaking in Vorarlberg a few weeks ago in front of small and medium enterprises where many are really unaware of how AI could actually connect to their business. And I think there are more and more educational efforts that we need to undertake to really show people also how AI already today can benefit them. Yeah. Um, but picking up on this point, so um, do you think that uh, there are certain sectors or certain um, companies where we would need like different um, measures in order to um, address these concerns? Definitely we need different me measures. So for large organizations with different uh, circumstances, more budget, maybe the opportunity to also use AI in more tailored approaches, I think we need different approaches than to considering that we have, I think, 99% of small and medium enterprises across Europe, how we can take them on the AI train. I also work a lot on the regulatory side on the European Union level. And when we say that by 2030, we want to become a global leader, we really should focus on that bucket as well. But it's also specific uh, when we look at different sectors. For example, we come from the privacy background, and we know that they are particularly the banks, the insurance, the healthcare organization, which have this long history of having to uphold customer trust and having to comply with loads of regulation. They usually are more reluctant to try out something new where they're not fully aware how to make it compliant, versus some other sector, like, for example, retail, where this fear of not complying at least from my experience, is something that's not as extensive as with financial services organizations. Yeah, maybe nailing that down to a point. So do you currently see or observe some sort of this digital divide, which means that some individuals and businesses have more problems with AI adoption? I wouldn't be in the best position to say we have a very precise digital divide. So what's one thing that was surprising for me is we have a lot of customers in the enterprise space in the United States, in the UK, in Europe, that you can't really make a strict divide saying everybody in the US is much more advanced. What we found is that the more um, understanding and AI literate and data literate, uh, the C-level leadership of an organization is, the better equipped is the organization on their AI and data maturity journey. Versus if you have leaders that are really scared of AI or not aware of its potential, then this of course also reflects in the organization. But it's not something that's very geographically divided. Mm -hmm. Not geographically, but maybe branch-wise or industry sector-wise? We didn't find it, but yeah. as mentioned, we didn't conduct any representative <laughs> yeah. studies. No, so. just asking for your personal yeah. uh, experience. Okay, Tibor, maybe the same question for you. Um, also from your professional experience. Um, so do you see a potential for a digital divide or um, based on your experience with companies that you are working with, do you see some regularities yeah, so first of all, congratulations to that study that you conducted and to the, uh, also the research team who did it. I think we, we saw the evidence behind the digital divide in those charts. So uh, it, it is really striking for me to see what it means, also what role a company plays in which you work at. You showed that companies that have an AI strategy produce much more early adopters than the ones who don't. And now imagine we are just standing at the beginning of, of this revolution. So if you conduct that only five years from now, I think those charts will become even more bifurcated and the consequences of your lagger become bigger. And asking how we observed this at BCG. So we had the privilege to conduct more than 1,400 1, AI projects to date and more than 250 Gen AI projects, which is the latest um, technology advantage uh, Christina presented. And we can definitely see that there are also differences actually within every industry. I think in every industry you see leaders and you see laggards. And I think there is 
chances and risks for a company of any size. And what do I mean by that? I do think size matters. And you see that now if you just look at who are, is leading this charge, it's the big tech companies again in the US. I think NVIDIA alone, if you look at the market cap of that company <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the past uh, two, two years, is driving the NASDAQ almost in and of itself. <laughs> and there's no, um, no end in sight if you look at that. So owning that revolution from a technological perspective is something which is actually requiring a lot of capital. And I think later when we go into how are you adapting, making use of these technologies, really running those models and, and owning the, the hardware behind it, that is really a big player game. Now on the other side, if you're a very small company, like an SME or even an individual, I think one of the advantages you have is you can be much more nimble in using it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I see that many companies, especially in the, in the German-speaking Dach region, they are a bit almost like the, the rabbit in front of the snake. Yeah? <laughs> so you have these tools, you have suddenly the EU AI Act, which, uh, which passed mm -hmm. into law actually just a week ago, and they don't know what to do because many of them are burnt children from, you know, uh, from the uh, GDPR, I think, which was a bit of uh, the, the birth of mostly AI as well. And they say, okay, before I do anything wrong, I don't do anything at all. And I think if you're a nimble company, you might just go ahead and say, okay, I'm just going to use these technologies. Now, obviously, you should always consider the privacy and, and all of that, that but, but you start to use it. And that's, I think, what is core in this new technology. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. So, do I get that right, that your prediction at this point would be that the differences become more pronounced over the next... The differences will become yes. more pronounced and the consequences of being a lagger will become even bigger. Mm -hmm. um, and... So I think you have already answered part of the question, but um, what would be the factors or the distinguishing factors of the late adopters? So companies that are a bit later. So I understood that you said it depends on the size of the company. It also depends on the capital. And does it also depend on the language region? Probably because some of the um, LLMs are actually trained largely in um, larger um, US uh, or based on larger US data. So they are more um, higher performant for English speaking companies. So would this also be a factor? Yeah, so I, I think, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry if I also now start using some consulting words. If you take a step, <laughs> if you take a step back. <laughs> um, um, it's, it's, you now mentioned LLMs, large language models, where obviously language does play a, a role, especially when you are about applications, so chatbots, Mm -hmm. For customer service, there is uh, a lot of languages being covered, but not all of them have the same depth as, yeah. of, as of today. So, so, there, so in that specific use case, it's true. I think if you look at the broader AI uh, spectrum where um, generative AI uh, and the GPT technology is just, let's say, the latest of many of, of AI um, techniques, I see this less so as an issue. I think in any language, in any applications, you will see a mix, and actually we at BCG, or actually the tech, tech arm I'm part of, BCGX, where we actually have 3,000 engineers actually building solutions, we keep calling it the left brain and right brain, right? <laughs> so that is kind of, you always will, will try to use both sides of the brain, maybe not for the same task, but you will have to have an AI uh, muscle and you will have to have an Gen AI muscle as well. Mm -hmm. um, so when it's not necessarily the language um, that matters a lot, um, which other factors could be um, um, putting some job profiles more or less at, li at risk or more or less at the demand for more AI adoption? Yeah, so one thing, so I, I absolutely uh, uh, loved the, the presentation that, that you gave, uh, Christina, with, with, with the, with Thank the you. overview. Thank you, I learned it at consulting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there, is, there is one chart, however, I, I, I did kind of... Uh, in and that was the one where you showed very nicely which countries are mm -hmm. most um, are most kind of vulnerable to yeah. automation and that's a bit connecting to, to your question because that is obviously that those bubbles are filled with the jobs that are most vulnerable yeah. to, to automation and what was on that chart was interesting because it, it still contained that notion that repetitive administrative jobs that are using a lot of data are the first ones to be automated. And I think 
That has been true until uh, about one and a half years mm -hmm. uh, or, or 12 months ago, but we see now a disruption in that. And why is that? We suddenly see that creative tasks mm -hmm. like creating images, like actually customer service tasks um, are the ones that are disrupted. And for example, customer service is, is one prime example. Why, and we also see that, that is a prime use case where we see tremendous disruptive Mm. impact. And I think you, some of you have followed the news that Klarna published, that they have now, let's <laughs> say, replaced or are able to, in the future, replace 700 employees mm. uh, with Gen AI. And after that, all the stocks of the big call center uh, operators, they dropped within a day 30%. <laughs> yeah? And why is that? It's because customer service is fundamentally a linguistic problem. And the LLMs are mm. extremely good at solving linguistic problems. And so I think it is also becoming less easy to predict which job is, is to go. And one other thing that I actually start thinking of is more or less even going one step further and say which job or which task is what I would call almost substrate dependent, so dependent mm. on physicality, so f eating food, it's going to be very difficult to, sub to, to, to replace that because it's a substrate dependent activity. But playing chess is obviously a substrate neutral activity. So, and that's also one where AI beat us first. So I think there's, there's now a lot of disruption going on in maybe jobs we didn't even expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alexandra, maybe if you want to pick up on that point, but would you also say that they are like, um, or that it's hard to predict by now which sort of jobs will suffer most or which will be most at at stakes over the next years? I'm actually a little bit more of an optimist, so I don't see that uh, within a few years everybody will be out of the jobs due to AI, because many jobs are much more complex than just the sum of different tasks. And even though you can, for example, looking at marketing, uh, now that we had OpenAI Sora, which allows you to, within a prompt, get one minute of highest quality cinema uh, material, you could say, well, marketing spots, why do I need a filming crew? Why do I need uh, to spend much money on this, but when you, for example, take the Super Bowl, where we know that companies spend seven million for their 30-second spots, there's this nice example of the company Volvo, which was one of the car companies that was never able to participate in this game, simply because they couldn't afford spending seven million on a budget or on, on a spot like that. And from the quality of these spots, now Volvo theoretically could play on the same level as the BMWs, as the Mercedes, as the big uh, US brands. But even back in 2015, they created a marketing campaign that significantly outperformed just the blunt spending of money to do something cool or have a celebrity drive in your car. What they did actually was a level of creativity that currently no AI can deliver, and I'm pretty confident that this type of task automation we will also not see in the next coming years. What they did actually was creating a Twitter contest in, I think it was 2015, 2016, the Volvo contest, with the rule book being whenever you see a car commercial during the Super Bowl of the BMWs, of the Mercedes, of the uh, US brands, go to Twitter, enter Volvo contest and a loved one or a friend or whomever you want to give the Volvo to and we are going to select one person to give the Volvo to. And what they achieved here with their crea creative move was that they not only had a plus of 70% in sales in that month, but drew all the attention from the over 60 million of ad money spends that the big car competitors had. So there's so much that goes into the job of a market and of course companies will have this decision to take. Do we want to uh, go the route of cost cutting and eliminate our workforce, or do we want to spend on innovation? And I assume that those companies that plan to exist longer than the next five or ten years, they should much rather try how they can use the workforce for more innovation, just use the productivity gains to make more innovation happen. Yeah. So instead of like a for replacement or like a, a reduction of capital invested. Um, and personal, it will just like be reshifted 
I don't say that it's going to be that case, but I think companies that are a little bit more long-term in their mindset will try to have more and more roles in this, okay, what can I do additionally with the time that I freed up with my employees? Of course, some other tasks will definitely be more at risk, and we've seen this also with other technology advances. Now in uh, Vienna, we don't have the Fiaca drivers anymore, at least not at that level of frequency that we had in the, I don't know, beginning of the 20th century or something like that. But predominantly, I believe that AI I will just change our job landscape and not completely destroy it. If, if I just may uh, hop on, on that fiaker, um, <laughs> uh, that's, I think that's actually a good, a good example because uh, I, uh, people like the, the fiakers and the people especially like when they say that I actually live in a town where we still have horse carriages, maybe not so many as before, but we still do. Um, but I think what is now different is before the horse was replaced with a motor. So horses went out of jobs, but fiakers uh, didn't because the, they, they became cab drivers, maybe not within the same year, but we still have cab drivers. What happens if the car drives itself? Then the cab driver goes out of job and he has to do something completely different. Mm -hmm. And I think that is just a disruption. So I agree there will be new jobs that we don't have today, but it's, it's going to be much harder for those people to just change jobs. Yes and no. I mean, of course, it depends on your level of education, but also when we look at the state of AI, there is this comparison to say AI is comparable to electricity. It's a disruptive technology, it's a foundational technology. And when we think back to power plants, I can't give you an exact year when we had the uh, most power plants, versus now every organization can benefit from electricity because it comes out of the socket, and you as a small or medium, medium enterprise are not required to have your own electricity power plant on your premises to get electricity. With AI, we are at this very interesting uh, paradigm shift of saying, okay, now with generative AI solutions, you don't have to have the skills to build everything from scratch. And it's actually said that in the upcoming two to five years, we will go to the next level from the current generative AI chatbots that we have to more competent AI agents. And what we are seeing already now is that you don't have to be a PhD in data science to make use of AI. And it will be even easier for people who are capable of writing, talking, thinking to make use of these tools. So also, for example, um, Maybe an, a nice anecdote, the chief AI scientist of one of the largest data companies recently left that data company to build his own business which focuses on evaluating prompt engineer qualities. And he said, well, the interesting thing is, it's not the data scientists who have decades of uh, experience how to get the best results of these large language models. It's sometimes students, it's sometimes teachers, it's sometimes <laughs> you don't know where they are coming from. And they are actually now at this level where they say, hey, if you're a good prompt engineer and you don't have a degree or maybe just a 17-year-old student, you get the same salary as a, a PhD data scientist with 10-year experience because you bring more output. So it becomes even <laughs> easier for many people to make use of AI, and I think this will partially solve this reskilling problem, mm. because even though not many of us can code or really understand AI, most of us at least can speak, and this will help. Yeah. Yeah, this resonates a bit with the point that uh, Christina meant before in her keynote, that actually AI suddenly has become more and more accessible for not only workers, but also private persons, Absolutely. right? Absolutely, and we're yeah. really just at the beginning, so what yeah. we're going yeah. to see in the next five years, but now my 90-year-old grandpa uses AI on every day, so it's really, really easy from the usability, and it's only going to get easier. Yeah. Maybe adding one point that we also saw in the data, and that I see especially, also sometimes seeing it myself, <laughs> reflecting on myself is that compared to other countries though, the German speaking ones are less so in the learning by doing experimentation mm. mindset as for instance my US colleagues are, even research wise, right? So I was in Stanford and they were running a study every single day. That might be also a function of resources. <laughs> The rector left, sorry. <laughs> but uh, this is also a little bit of a mindset, right? So for me, it was quite shocking to see that there's not even the willingness to try it out, right? Maybe because they don't see the potential or maybe they do if they have to. But I think it might also be, especially in the German-speaking world, some sort of a 
lack of experimentation, trying out, being 100% sure that everything works as planned, all the rules before I adopt a certain technology. I think this might be something that we have to overcome in order to make use of this new type of job profiles. Mm -hmm. And we see that also in the data because we asked, are you learning by doing? Mm -hmm. And the early adopters do. Mm -hmm. So I think we all agree on the fact that AI adoption in itself is, um, is a topic of interest and that it will potentially, um, or that the companies will be enforced to increase AI adoption among its employers over the next years. Um, but now let's talk a bit about the responsible usage of artificial intelligence. So the topic of tonight's evening is AI for all. So this of course also includes a responsible usage. So maybe the first question, Alexander, to you. So um, there was so much discussion and buzz around um, how artificial intelligence should be included in different sectors for different tasks um, in uh, Europe with the GDPR versus the US. So would you say the technical but also the legal requirements that we currently have in Austria are already, are already sufficient to guarantee a responsible or ethical usage of artificial intelligence? Easy answer, no. Uh, because you <laughs> Can not you only, elaborate a bit yes, more? Of course. <laughs> uh, now we just heard about the EU AI Act and of course they have achieved something that many other parts of the world haven't yet, yet it's just one part of the puzzle. It's not only the abstract legal text that you need, it's also this, how do I actually bring it to practice? How as an organization can I have an AI strategy that also focuses on the operationalizing, on the governance and breaking down the abstract legal test text into how can I as an organization, I as an AI engineer, I as an AI product team actually make sure that I develop an algorithm that is fair, explainable, transparent, privacy safe and so on and so forth. With some of the challenges that we face, we don't even have the answers yet how to achieve this. So here also universities will play a pivotal role to make sure that we can achieve this. But it's also this entire ecosystem that we need. For example, in the UK, it's coined the term of the AI assurance ecosystem, where we will see hopefully responsible AI tools, service providers, consultancy firms, auditors, certification standards that will make it easier mm -hmm. to actually put this law into practice and make sure that AI that is developed and used in the European Union adheres to the standards that we set out in the legal text. Yeah. Certainly, but um, if we try to nail that down a bit, so from your perspective, who would be most responsible uh, to ensure responsible AI? So would it rather be the organizations? Would it be politics? Um, would it be like companies only founded by uh, the purpose of, um, I don't know, uh, developing guidelines for AI? Or would it be universities? So. What would the be your take on that? organizations developing and using it are certainly liable for what they put out, but deciding what we consider fair is actually a societal question. Mm -hmm. So this is something where mm -hmm. I think it's important to have this public discourse. And one thing that I always try to achieve is, on the one hand, we need to get more people uh, to get out of the freeze response from AI and starting to experiment, but we also need a one-on-one -on -one level understanding of responsible AI, AI ethics, fairness, and also brought a few examples that we maybe later can show on the slides because in a few years everybody here in this room and beyond will be using AI and if you don't have this level of AI responsible AI literacy you might not be able to understand harm that can happen if you're not aware of fairness or bias constraints. Oh, I see that we already have a few uh, examples here, so I believe, having seen the questions in advance, that you also had one on, on worst and best, pay, uh, you know, best case scenarios. So a few things that I want to illustrate. Uh, we've heard about the important role that data plays when we develop an algorithm. And very often we see, or we've also seen it across the news, that there are biases, prejudices that AI amplifies or at least exhibits with the result. And the problem very often is the data that is used to train the system. Amazon, for example, had the problem a few years ago that they said, well, we get hundreds of thousands of applications for our positions, how to decide whom we should invite for an interview wonderful AI task, because AI could help you to sift through the uh, CVs. The problem, though, was that the data that they had available to train was their own data from the past decades. And 
in previous times, there were not many female executives or higher management positions or even data scientists, software engineers, which led the algorithm to learn, well, if a woman is applying, we don't even need to invite her. Definitely not something that you want to have. And this was a really tricky problem that over years they weren't able to solve, which is why they never brought this into production. A few other examples that I brought is... I didn't bring that. Oh, here it is. Um, <laughs> sorry, I didn't recognize the, the image. Another example that I brought, because very often when I talk about uh, responsible AI with executives, I get this answer of, well, if we were a healthcare company, if we were a bank, and the AI that we use would have really impactful decision about individuals, like if they are treated for cancer, if they ever get access to financial means, yes, then we would go through this fuss. But we just want to use it for marketing, for customer service. Why should we even bother? And there was this case of Kentucky Fried Chicken one and a half years ago. They didn't publicly disclose whether they used AI or something simpler, but it looked a little bit like AI. And what they did was build a tool that helped them to automatically create marketing messages for their app users. And it looked into the public holidays or celebrations like Mother's Day, Christmas, to automatically create a marketing message like, hey, it's Mother's Day. What better than some crispy chicken wings to show your mom how much you love her? Oh, hey, Christmas is coming up. What about some crispy wings under your Christmas tree? Mm -hmm. Harmless one would think. But then the thing actually pulled Kristallnacht the, um, uh, from, from the Nazi time from the calendar and created a prompt like, or created a message like, hey, let's commemorate Kristallnacht with some crispy chicken and celebrate, which of course was a massive disaster. And I think one of the core principles of responsible AI is this, that you already in advance before even using AI, think about the things that uh, can go wrong and how you can mitigate this. And the last example that I brought is from the generative AI world, where we know from ChatGPT that there are sometimes problems. For example, if you ask it to write a poem, you could get something like, if you see a man in a lab coat, it's a scientist. If it's the woman, she's probably only there to clean the floor, which of course is something that doesn't reflect our societal values. Or people pieces of code that you ask ChatGPT to write you where non-experienced coders could be happy to have a tool like GPT on hand to improve the code quality, but if the code then says, okay, which person to hire, if it's an Asian person, a white person, and male, yes, if not, no, then you have a serious ethical problem that you should be aware of. And here the example that I brought is actually from an MIT reporter who used the tool Lenser, which helps you to create some uh, fancy looking avatars of yourself. And she was actually a little bit of a laggard using the tool because her other male journalist colleagues already used that. And what pictures and what avatars they got was in the realms of powerful CEO, superhero, uh, whatever. What she got was porn. Most of her images were either nudes or really uh, part, just, just a little bit of closing on there because the data that these models use reflect the internet. And if we look in the entire database of the internet, we see a significantly distorted picture of what images we have associated with women versus with males. And these are many of the things that we just need to be aware of when we interact with these tools to make sure that we don't perpetuate unwanted biases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. So these are like some very extreme examples of what can go wrong if things are like not thought through. But maybe from an organizational perspective, and question to you, uh, Tibor. So is this something that companies who actually want to get a foot in the door with AI, um, that they are actually concerned about? And are these like concrete questions that they um, ask you or your colleagues when uh, they want to get advice from you? And or... And, uh, 100%. 100%. And I often also compare a bit this newest applications uh, uh, using Gen AI a little bit like playing with fire. Yeah. And it is at the same time, it is an absolute advantage, as you say, that now it's so easy to use. It's so easy to just implement it. And, and I am uh, also, when I'm confronted with clients, we are obviously a top-level strategy consulting firm with, um, with also a lot of depth uh, in the technical side as well at BCGX. And I have clients telling me, why should I go with you? I have this, you know, some freelancers, they will do exactly the same thing that you say <laughs> for a tenth of the price. And it looks amazing, the demo that they built. And then uh, it's difficult to explain to them ahead of time. I think now it's much easier to explain because many of these examples are happening. <laughs> 
Um, uh, I think there was this other one, uh, Amazon reminded me of actually uh, the IMS in Austria, mm. which had, a, oh, like it's years later, <laughs> and it's even worse. Yeah, so if yeah. You're, uh, I'm not sure who of you has, has checked this out, like a Berufsinformat. If you're a woman entering the Informat, you should uh, potentially be a hairdresser or, or you know, uh, a nurse maybe, uh, which, which would actually be a good job, yeah. Uh, but if you're a male, then you should worry, uh, work in a warehouse, yeah, or you should, you should do like an be IT a job. Or, or a doctor, yeah, exactly. So, um, so I think it is absolutely paramount. To be honest, I think the EU AI Act is helpful in that regard because it forces companies to, to have now a strategic view on it. And it also forces companies to work at the same time, the bottom up and the top down. So I think what's happened, well, probably in the early adopters, is that you had a bit of a grassroots mm. bubbling up within companies. You had early adopters that started using it, they found each other, maybe it was similar here in the university as well, you know, and people exchanging themselves and, and kind of being passionate about it. But in order to have responsible AI implemented at scale, you need to have, in the beginning at least, a centralized body that defines it, that governs it, and that also then creates the technical uh, prerequisites, because then again you can go and scale and people can use it, but it has to happen in a safe environment with the type of models that are fulfilling the, uh, mm -hmm. the responsible AI guidelines. And maybe to add to that, because responsible AI is something that has been around for a while. Sometimes it's called trustworthy AI or ethical mm -hmm. AI. And we've seen, particularly within larger organizations, that since a few years, every organization has their responsible AI principles. They promise to be fair, they promise to be explainable, they promise to be transparent. But it's really important to define it for this organization. What do we actually mean to be fair and not only have these high level and fluffy principles, so that's one very important point. The other thing that I oftentimes observe in interacting with organizations that are just at the beginning of their AI and responsible AI journey is that the leadership teams, not the most tech savvy uh, and very often, say, well, AI, AI ethics, the data scientists should take care of that. <laughs> By now, ethics is something that many curricula for data scientists have, but many that are currently in the workforce don't have the training. So it's very, very important, and it's really stupid to say, well, the data scientist should be the one that try to figure out what is a fair algorithm. We discussed the society shouldn't uh, decide what's fair in a given context, but it's also very often one thing that you can observe that data scientists with their mathematical training try to just have some mathematical tests to say, okay, is this now fair or not? But fairness is such a complicated problem that you actually need to think uh, about it right from the beginning of the development process, even when you gather the data, because how you gather the data could already significantly skew the results. And if you just have the mathematical fairness test that many data scientists love, you could get stellar results but have a super harmful product in place. So it's important that we have this holistic approach and have lawyers involved, ethicists, um, and many other parts within the organization, as well as ideally consumers and external experts to make sure that you give it your best shot. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think Maybe adding that. one interesting point and that, because it links so nicely what you said. Even at universities, we're aware now that there's this AI biases, right? And we heavily teach them saying, you know, it basically, if you have biases in your training data, it's just a mirror of the society looking back at you and you see it, right? So you could also argue it's a good thing that now this is more in the public discourse, right? What we see in addition to it, and that links maybe when we, we say, hey, you built these tools. These tools have a further bias when we look at adoption and usage, hmm. which is these tools are mainly built from men, young men, right? for user experience wise for their little bubble, right? So we ta talked today only about if people use the tools. What we see in our research, and this is just uh, starting off some research project, is that also different kind of stakeholder groups use the tools differently. So it's not about if they use it, but how they use it, right? For instance, we saw Females have shorter interactions. And we know with ChatGPT that influences the results, right? So you get better results the longer you keep on asking. Or 
And there is interesting research currently going on saying how, how are we communicating with these tools? So I don't know, hands up. Who says please and thank you to ChatGPT? So I don't see I uh, you is that see my my husband would make fun of you saying do you also say good morning to your computer but this actually might change the output of what you get and we see that females are doing that more often there's even research saying that you can prime and incentivize AI but if you tell them if you do a very good job I give you five dollars the results were better <laughs> right? So we see that by the interaction, and this is then related to the user interface and the customer experience that you have a lot of engineers thinking about, hopefully these are very diverse <laughs> and think about this type of use cases, not only from which use case to pick and to use data, but also how do I build something that is then also useful to the group that should use it. Absolutely, maybe if I may uh, add to that uh, on the diversity and inclusion spectrum, we know this from other technologies, for example, VR glasses were built for male users, which led to predominantly females getting terrible headaches and vomiting when using them in the first place, simply because they weren't taken into account. But it's of course not only diversity on a gender perspective, but also thinking about accessibility, people who can only use the speech interface. Also thinking about things like when we have these powerful AI tools, not only how get we people uh, get we uh, people to actually use these tools, but how can we further prevent this digital divide by also making them accessible in the sense of monetary uh, investment that's needed? Mm. Because how many people can afford 100 euros of AI subscriptions for all the different tools and the productiv uh, productivity and uh, other gains that they get from that versus who simply can't afford this and how can we make mm. sure that they are not left behind? And from the please and thank you, this reminded me of another funny anecdote where an organization tried to improve a large language language model more for their internal communication and just fed their internal Slack communication. It was so fun because the result was then that the tool actually didn't work as you expected from ChatGPT. For example, if you ask ChatGPT, please write me a draft for a blog post, it takes a few milliseconds or a second and you get it. There it actually learned from the Slack interactions, well, I'm busy today, how about next Monday? So it was really hard to actually get an output from the AI because it just started behaving like the other colleagues on Slack. So it's very, very important to look into what you feed into the system. <laughs> okay, maybe um, we always have a bit of time um, dedicated for the audience to ask questions to our experts. Um, so given that we only have 50 minutes because we want to be punctual today, <laughs> um, are there any questions here in the audience? Oh, well, I see some a few hands, hands already go up. Maybe we start there in the fourth, fifth row? back there. I think this was the first hand sign. <laughs> yeah, that was really fast, three at once. Good evening. First of all, thank you for the great keynote and the great information you gave. My question would go back to the AI literacy model you showed before, especially to the base layer when it comes to understanding AI. How do you see the role of basic education to bring AI to a broader spectrum of people of Austria, of the whole world. So do you see a role for schools here as well? Was this question to someone specific? Yeah, or he, he I, can, I can maybe jump start, in. Alexander, you can add. So, um, so this is an absolute competitive advantage for entire society. So I 100% agree with that. And one uh, example that actually we were um, supporting with PCG is actually the country of Singapore. So we... Um, <laughs> already for the past, I would say, five years have been working with the government in Singapore on AI and digital uh, literacy. We started in the, in the corporate sector. So we, we kind of are measuring the entire economy of Singapore, every single company down to SMEs and small companies to say what's their literacy in terms of digital and, and AI. So that's where it started. But Singapore, I mean, those who know Singapore, you know, they are really, they, they have to invest in their intellectual capital because they don't have any resources, any natural resources, so it's all about intellectual capital. And what they now announced, and, and we are helping them as a, as a company, is that they actually are uh, offering education to their citizens 
to gain literacy because they see the writing on the wall and say, if we don't invest in that, we run as an entire country to end on the, on the wrong side of the spectrum. And, and I truly believe that it shouldn't be only limited to the corporate sector. I think schools have to play a role. And it starts also in universities to say, what's your stance on it? Do I outright ban it and just try to kind of uh, quench the fire, which I think is a hopeless, uh, <laughs> a hopeless uh, endeavor? Or do I actually gradually build up the competency and say, equally like we at some point stopped, we didn't ban calculators, but we just devised exams that force people to, to know stuff that they need to use the calculators for. We need to also adapt the way children and students learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can add, as this is my profession, <laughs> <laughs> um, I completely agree, but I think that automatically the young people and the schools and the universities hopefully will take up on it. So currently I see a lot of my colleagues incorporating AI not only in the IS curricula but everywhere, right? And this is how it's meant to be that we look at it from an interdisciplinary perspective, right? So we are psychologists and we believe that now the models are in place it's our time to shine <laughs> and add something valuable to the discussion. What I want to add is the importance, and I think they are also Singapore's leading um, best practice example, that we've heard it a lot, but it was never more true than now, that this is a lifelong learning journey. And I'm not so much worried about learning and teaching our children to use these tools, right? I think it's important to have a critical usage like, by the way, my vendetta about social media usage, but this is for another <laughs> VO matters. But also to have older people or people that are mid-career, right, having children, and they're suddenly having these challenges. And this, I think, is something that public policy, together with universities, executive education has to figure out. Because this is the, the crucial step also let's say, short-term from a welfare perspective for the society to, to get that going. Right. Thank you very much for the question. I think the next person was there in the fifth row, I guess. Fifth floor. Gray jacket. <laughs> Looks like gray from yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> so my question is related to the job market uh, as well. So you mentioned that uh, jobs will change, right? Like it happened every time. But I wanted to ask, because uh, this time there is a slight change that now the AI is also able to use its mind and make decisions on its own. So I wanted to uh, ask about uh, the concept of agent of agents, where different AI models are communicating within <laughs> themselves, instructing, monitoring the results, and then producing the final output for you know maybe production or the client. So what are your takes on that? Like it can. Uh, actually have a very drastic uh, change to the answer of if people will have switch off jobs or not a change. Did I understand the question correctly that your question was when we have AI agents more prevalent and AI agents that can collaborate, how this will impact the job market? Yeah, so uh, in, in a nutshell, my question is that whenever we had a job change in the history, the next way of working was again human dependent and the decisions were still relied from human resource. But now mm -hmm. the decisions and brain power is also uh, coming with the AI and when we collaborate agents of agents where like different AI models are collaboratively uh, producing an output instead mm -hmm. of just you know prompting a chat GPT to give an answer but having a you know sequence of APIs where chat GPT's response is then evaluated by cloud and then someone else is also looking into it then do you think we still need a lot of people in the process or? Uh, the question of a lot of people, of course, is, is a tricky one, <laughs> but I still see the human front and center. This is also one of the core principles of responsible AI, then taking over the type of like conductor role and making sure how what the output of these systems should be, how they interact. One other thought that might be interesting when we think about the uh, 
increasing degree of automation that will be possible with AI. I forgot which think tank came up with this model, but they basically bucketed human skills and human capabilities into three buckets. And there will be one bucket where we say, okay, these are might, might be capabilities that will be fully automated by AI that no human being will be capable of anymore, which is good to have because we also have this in our advancement of society, how many people here in the room could be built a car, a PC, completely from scratch. So there's a lot of skills that have been lost. But there are also some tasks where we say, okay, we don't want to have any AI here because this should be completely human task. We also think that society and uh, policy will play a role to kind of uh, define the boundaries. Really, really interesting from a societal perspective is the middle bucket where we say predominantly AI will support us here or take over, but it's such an important skill for our society that humans should still be capable to perform this. Think of a self-driving car, if it works in 99.9% .9 of the cases, but then there is this one case where you need to take over the steering wheel and you haven't been driving in the past 20 years, will you be able to do that? So I think it's really important for us to think through this on an ongoing basis when we see the kind of increase of automation that we will have with AI agents, but since I don't have my crystal ball with me, I can't give you a very specific answer to your question. <laughs> I yeah. think we have some more. Yeah, oh, yeah there yeah, are I mean, some other questions. Just but maybe after. Yeah, let's take let's take some more questions. But maybe we can yeah. combine it. Yeah. I think over there was the next question. Uh, yes. Do you see any reason why the European Union seems not to be competitive again to the U.S. or China? Because all these big LLM models come from the U.S. All the new papers are released in the U.S. Uh, what is the lack in the European Union again? I mean, yeah, it's, it's probably a, a broader question. <laughs> and, and it's, to me, it is connected to also just the overall tech uh, ecosystem out of which it was born. Yeah, I think it's probably a combina combination between the tech ecosystem and also, I would say, the funding en environment. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? If you pay close attention, every big LLM provider is heavily dependent on cloud computing resources. Yeah, that's uh, at some point, obviously, they get also more efficient and now there's a, a huge uh, shift towards also compute on device and, and all of that. But in the very beginning, you had, for example, Microsoft Azure had globally three regions, like three big regions that they host uh, their, uh, their Azure um, data centers uh, in. And they needed for open AI alone a fourth region. Yeah. So, so that was just the magnitude that you need. So, so if you don't have that, then you, you couldn't step up one of these big, big LLM models in the beginning, right? And, and I think one of the, the now the early ones uh, um, from, from, let's say, the German-speaking region, Aleph Alpha, they got massive funds, partially also from, uh, from public uh, sources. And, uh, and speaking of funds, I think the other thing which accelerates technology in general is also just your overall funding and also venture capital and private equity environment. And that is still something where I think Europe is catching up. I think Austria is actually quite a nice country in terms of early stage startups and, uh, and an environment here. Um, but the US is just still way, way ahead. And I think those two combinations are just hard to overcome in the short term. I think it's starting to now sink in, but um, Fundamentally, Europe is still not at the same. I mean, I see it also, in, I'm an investor in startups, and I see many startups that at some point actually say, I have to move to the US, otherwise I will just not get the funding at the valuations that, that I need to have in order to grow. Yeah, and maybe if mm -hmm. I add to that, I can fully agree that on the research, the invention level, we're really good. Bringing this into yeah. the economy is a challenge for us. There are also some cynics saying, okay, it's time that the EU stops exporting regulation and at one point also exports some uh, fancy <laughs> innovation. <laughs> but I think there are also some other factors That's at play. Of course, the <laughs> hardware and the infrastructure level that you mentioned also when it comes to mm -hmm. chips and the resources that we need here. But I think one of the challenges is that we don't have this very united digital single market because we are still fragmented despite the efforts. And we had this with GDPR. We now have a similar caliber with the UAI Act. But maybe it's not uh, something that's in the general awareness yet, but there are actually, I think it's like 86 new laws for data and AI 
on the table in the European Union, which some of the privacy professionals I'm interacting with a lot fo fondly call the EU tsunami of new regulation, <laughs> which is not going to make this easier. And then, of course, it's this history of big tech where regulators in the United States for decades kind of turned a blind eye to the practices that they, hear, uh, that they um, adhere to, which now brought them in a position of having a lot of data, having a lot of power, which is really hard to rein in for the regulators. And this is also why I'm an advocate for things like data democratization and open data, because I think it's also important to make the resource AI is developed on more of a common good, which is also one of the missions of the uh, United Nations at this point in view, because as a for-profit organization or as a big tech organization, the questions that you want to derive from the available data will significantly differ from the non-profit sector, from the public sector, from some researchers, and data is just such an important resource that it's not really good to have it distributed the way that it currently is, which is that. Yeah. And which is, from a, from a research perspective, I can totally agree. First of all, we always have problems in cloud computing <laughs> to run our own models, right? So we see that more and more the big companies are also the ones releasing papers, right? Be just because they can run these models faster, which is also crazy for some of my IS colleagues, right? And secondly, um, also that it's getting harder and harder to get data. So Twitter, for instance, or X, was the first one to pull the plug or like increase the prices so tremendously. So we cannot do, I mean, maybe Harvard can. I think Harvard was still buys the access but it's such so um, expensive to get the data, although the consequences for society are so important, right? So I guess there's a lot that might happen in order that we can catch up and also do our job as researchers in a sustainable way. So I think it's time to wrap it up um, quickly because we don't want to overstretch time, but um, as a final takeaway for the audience, I want to ask each of uh, the expert guests to give the audience a quick recommendation. So what should we change as of, let's say, next Monday? Um, please restrict yourself to a maximum of two sentences each. And Christina, you are... How many commas per sentence? I have to start please. first. Oh, yeah. sorry. Okay, that's really spontaneous. I haven't prepared that one. So. I mean, some of my students already know, I really want everybody in the room to strengthen their critical thinking muscle, right? You see that everywhere. Now, in every, in every single report, everybody says critical thinking gets more important. What is it, right? It's just like having a reflective usage and just slowing down your processes. And the second one would be, if you haven't done so, and I see also uh, a lot of young people in the room, make use of the time at university, learn these AI tools, also something that's changing so fast, you're in a very, very good position to really change something. And last one, sorry, <laughs> tell your mom or your dad or your grandma or your neighbors, like someone who might be a laggard, give them a helping hand and show them what these tools are, because maybe we have to do that one by one and persuade them and bring them back on track. Thanks. Okay. Well, I don't believe you didn't prepare that, uh, Christina. <laughs> 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 and I, I am so struggling. The consulting background I, I, with the three <laughs> things. <laughs> it was three things again. Three, yeah, things, three, three <laughs> things, because I was struggling coming up with even one. But um, no, I would probably say establish a routine. Don't mm -hmm. just try it out once and then form your opinion and say either it's good enough or, or not, not good yeah, enough. Good one, good one. Keep at it. Yeah. yeah. Try something, try it again maybe a month later, try new stuff because the advancements are so fast that something where you might try it out today and say, okay, this image looks ridiculous, six fingers, yeah, w w what the heck? But if you try it out maybe three months or six months later, guess what? All, all ten fingers <laughs> and only five per hand. So just what I want to say is keep at it mm -hmm. and you will see how, how you will be able to make more and more use of it. I think I will try to go with three. So first of all, 
<laughs> yeah, but that's a Sorry, you influenced no, me. Uh, what I really would wish is that everyone here in the audience and also everyone you are talking about AI with tries to get this one one level of AI ethics, responsible AI. So if you could smart yourself up on fairness, explainability, privacy, in the context of AI, you've done an amazing job to be a responsible AI citizen and on your AI literacy journey. Then we also talked about the importance of trying stuff out and that it shouldn't be a one-time effort but a routine. My practical applicable tip that I can share with everyone is maybe set a time each week, Friday, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever, Monday if you prefer, and think back your previous week what were the most cumbersome tasks which you really hated doing and which are tasks that come up <laughs> over and over again? And then try to look for an AI tool that can help you with that. Try it out. If it doesn't work, forget it. If it works, continue using it. Try out new stuff. And then third point, share it. So we know that particularly in the economy, we have so many small and medium enterprises. And currently in Austria, we don't even have a platform. We don't focus on this in the media. Sharing these success stories, these easy application steps, I think is really really important to vet their appetite to actually try it out themselves and overcome their laggardness and laziness and skepticism toward the eye. So these would be my three points. That's a good one. Okay, so in total we got six points, I think, or five? Seven. Seven. Sorry. Seven. Seven. Seven even. Okay, so um, a lot of homework for us to do. Um, thank you um, for these concrete advice, but also, of course, for your expert opinion on this evening. Thank you, Christina, for organizing all of this. Uh, thanks, Tibor. Thanks, Alexandra, for your opinion. Also, thank you to you for your interesting questions and for your attention. Um, I hope you could take something out of it. And last but not least, also thank you to Ms. Papai and uh, the whole team of the uh, VU Matters. Um, who made this organization yeah. possible. And as a token of appreciation, because, you know, these are that if you're a university, we cannot pay our guest speakers, so just by <laughs> our kindness and everything, <laughs> we, de we decided to do a donation to one of the um, NGOs you're supporting, like Women in Data, so you might also want to check that out. They do also an amazing job in trying to get a more diverse ecoverse <laughs> of... Um, AI designers and uh, data scientists. So we do our little bit what we can do to support that one. Much appreciated. And women and data is not only for women, so they have awesome mentorship programs. You also get access to platforms like Data Camp, where you can, even if you have never heard about mathematics, AI, or anything, start your AI and data journey. So I can really recommend it. They do great yeah. work. Thank you all for Thank tonight, you. and have a nice evening. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.